Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that, the, that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, peace, and mercy to you, Jesus Christ. Having the benefit of knowing how the Bible stories end, it can sometimes be easy to be impatient or even frustrated with this crowd that's chasing after Jesus. How can people bother Jesus for another round of loaves and fishes when he will serve up his very life on the cross to draw all people to himself and take away our sin and the sin of the world? And if we put ourselves in Jesus' shoes, I find myself thinking, again, how can this group who the previous day was just fed bread and fish, a miraculous feat, if I were Jesus, I'd be saying, what more do you want? What more, do, what more can I do? What do I need to show to prove to you? Yet Jesus says, do not work for the food that perishes but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Humanity will give you, in verse 27. And it's easy for us to compare and get impatient because we know what Jesus did concerning this story. But at this time, though, these people on the shores of Galilee, they didn't know. And they didn't understand what God was planning through Jesus. That's a benefit we have. They did not. In previous weeks, we've seen an emerging pattern of worry, doubt, fear, and weak faith. This pattern is easy to see and even easier to say because we know, again, the end of God's story for us and the world, as well as for all the people in the Bible. Manna, quail, promised land, suffering, death, resurrection, water, word, table, and abundant and eternal life. So could it be that we work for the food that perishes rather than the food that endures for the eternal life of Jesus Christ gives us because we are unwilling or unable to name what we truly hunger for and seek? Why do you suppose that is? Is it fear of being disappointed? A need to somehow to protect God? Clarity that we're not deserving? 
Maybe we fear being wrong. Perhaps we lack trust and have arrogance. Maybe we think we know better. All these things come to mind. But as Christians, we're called to trust. God has planted God's love and grace within us. But if I, as I think of this, a, a quote came across my uh, LinkedIn account last week from C.S. Lewis. And it says, um, human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God, which will make him happy. <clears throat> I see that in, in today's story. The crowd chases him, looking for yet something else. Why do we settle for signs of God's grace, bread from whatever source, rather, rather than seeking and expecting God's immortal love for us? Jesus and the disciples take off in the middle of the night to Capernaum. The disciples, even fresh off witnessing this massive feeding, do not trust Jesus in the boat and are afraid. In the Exodus reading, we hear the Israelites crying out how they wish the Lord had killed them in Egypt when they were surrounded by all the bread and meat they could eat instead of starving to death in the wilderness. They are worried, doubting. Their faith is weak. Yet they are reminded to draw near to the Lord, for God did hear their complaints and does rain down food on them. So they were full once again, showing them that God will always take care of them. And again, in last week's gospel, with Jesus feeding the crowd of 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and two fish, the crowd witnesses this fantastic miracle, and yet today, are still doubting. When they realize that Jesus is no longer there, they get in the boat and cross the lake to find him. But their search for Jesus was not motivated, motivated by seeing the miracle. It was inspired by wondering where their next meal will come from. And when they find him and question him, he says, the work of God is this. To believe in the one he has sent. And he confirms that Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And it still was not enough for them. Witnessing a miracle, providing the bread and fish on the beach, the disciples and the mob of people still asked to be offered another sign. They did not, did not trust Jesus. Show us proof, they say. How often do we do this in our own lives? How often do we seek and ask God to prove himself to us? How often do we worry needlessly? Or we pray for things that we want, and yet God is answering, perhaps differently than we would like. Or like the disciples in the 5,000, we simply just are not seeing what God has in store for us. When I think of that, I'm reminded of a popular story of the drowning man. <clears throat> this fellow was stuck on a rooftop in a flood. And he's praying for God for help. Soon a man in a rowboat comes by. And shouts to the man on the roof, jump in, I can save you. The stranded fellow shouts back and says, no, it's okay. I'm praying to God and he is going to save me. So the rowboat goes on. Pretty soon then a motorboat comes by. The fellow in the motor show, motorboat shouted, jump in, I can save you. The man again on the roof replies, no, it's okay. I'm praying to God. God will save me. Pretty soon, a helicopter comes by and drops a rope and hollers down, grab the rope, we will take you to safety, we will save you. And the man once again replies, no, it is okay, I have faith, God will save me. The helicopter reluctantly flies on, the waters rise up, the man drowns, dies, and goes to heaven. 
And in heaven, he finally gets a chance to talk to God. And he says, God, I had faith. I had faith. But you did not save me. God says, I sent you a rowboat, a motorboat, and a helicopter. What more did you want me to do? You know, so many times in our life, we don't see. We don't see those miracles. We don't trust those miracles. We don't have those in front of us. Just like the man on the roof. Each one of us has doubted. Each one of us has been afraid. Each one of us has been a disciple in the boat questioning. And in the Bible, the phrase, do not be afraid, shows 365 times. Do not be afraid should be a daily reminder to us that God knows that Jesus is the bread of life sent to us from heaven and God will sustain us. Trust, do not be afraid. We are called to trust, which is not easy. That's why John spent so much time in the stories, encouraging, reminding, nudging us. It was hard for the Israelites who were starving in the wilderness. It wasn't easy for those in Capernaum, and it's hard for us today, especially if someone is suffering, if you've lost someone close, maybe you're having a difficult time at work, struggle with disease. All of these struggles can make us doubt and lose trust. We need to remind ourselves that God is in control and God has us. And we assume that we have to work to get what we truly hunger for. And along with the crowd, we think that that critical question when we encounter God is, what must we do to perform the works of God in verse 28? But Jesus responds to us as he did the crowd, this is the work of God, that you believe in whom God has sent. To believe is to trust that God is doing something new, that human created conditions and circumstances cannot undermine or negate. To believe is to submit everything, even our highest stake issues, to God's saving work in Jesus. To believe is not so much what we do as being open to what God is doing. Being available and open to God and offering everything to Jesus implies that our doing is less important because we are not then in charge, let alone in control. Now, if we give up all control, it does make sense. And we can understand the crowd asking, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? In verse 30, much like the crowd need one more sign, many times we need one more sign, one more revelation. Like that crowd was searching for a political king like David and a prophet like Moses, they're yearning for a similar, similar sign to the manna in the wilderness. And they call out, Moses gave manna to their ancestors, and their ancestors believed. And this is where Jesus quickly reminds that God, not Moses, fed the people in the wilderness. And what made that feeding a sign was not the manna itself, but the fact that the manna came down from heaven. And that manna was only an appetizer for the true bread that came down from heaven in Jesus, who gives life through his teaching and his flesh. Because God sent Jesus. Verse 35, Jesus is the bread that fills all our hunger and thirst. And Jesus frees us to follow him, not to achieve self-satisfaction, not getting anything in it for us, not even to attain or maintain peace of mind. Jesus frees us to embrace God's redeeming will, to restore the universe to God's creation and humanity and what God intends. Such faith does not mean separating the spiritual out of the social. Actually, it means putting God rather than us at the center of everything. And when we do, we can and will expect more. John's recently fed crowd misunderstands the nature of what Jesus has offered them and its implications at the time. 
How many times have we misunderstood? John positions us to ask the question, what does it mean for Jesus to be the manna? How is Jesus like the manna? The benefits of eating the bread Jesus provides are the same as the Israelites. Jesus' bread offers life to those who trust enough to follow God's word. God provided both water and food where none was available, and Jesus also satisfies those who hunger and thirst. As manna, Jesus is the trusted source of life. Just as eating manna for years in the wilderness taught Israel to trust and follow God's word in Deuteronomy, so also John portrays Jesus today as one who instills trust and life in those who partake of his bread. Amen.